name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto thee all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended thee, and justly deserve thy temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray thee of thy boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor or sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto you, and in the stead, and by the command of my Lord, Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.
and sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For thou only art holy, thou only art the Lord, thou only Beseech thee, let thy continual pity cleanse and defend thy church. And because it cannot continue in safety without thy succor, preserve it evermore by thy help and goodness. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. The Old Testament lesson appointed for reading on this, the 15th Sunday following Trinity, is recorded for us in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, four, verses 4 through 7. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Here ends the lesson. We sing responsively the 15th portion of Psalm 119. Thank you. 
The Holy Epistle is recorded for us in St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, verse 25, reading through chapter 6, verse 10. Brethren, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks of himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in one another, for each one shall bear his own load. Let him who is taught the word share all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Here ends the Holy Epistle. It is Please arise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel appointed for this day is recorded for us in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, beginning in chapter 6 at the 24th verse. Jesus taught, saying, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. 
for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Here ends the Holy Gospel. the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated.
dear fellow redeemed by the blood of the spotless Lamb of God who came in all humility to win salvation for us. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear the words of the epistle lesson once again. St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, verse 25 through 6, verse 10. Brethren, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another, for each one shall bear his own load. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, make us holy in the truth. Your word is true. Amen. Brothers and sisters, once again, a little, little caveat or reminder as I begin that when a sermon is preached, it is not always suggesting that you're not doing what you should do and get at and, and do it. If you hear the words of this sermon and you say, well, I'm doing these things, good. Then it's encouragement to keep on keeping on, right? And if you hear these words and, and one or two things come out and you go, hmm, maybe I'm not doing so well at that, well, there you go, okay? Um, then you're encouraged to work on these things. But that's what much of the New Testament is, in fact, is a lot of encouragement to do what you are already doing. Or another way to look at this, interestingly enough, and this comes out quite frequently, and it certainly comes out in this text, is that we actually act according to what God says we are. So, if God calls you holy, then act like someone who's actually holy, right? Or in this text, um, if you're it, let us also walk in the spirit, okay? Be what you are and stop Fighting against it is one way to look at, look at this. So in, um, in a lot of ways, this particular text looks at the relationship between clergy and laity as well as clergy to clergy and laity to laity. It kind of covers how we act toward one another in a lot of ways. Okay. And so there are certain things that we can gain from this text. We gain a bit of a correction on what our expectation should be of one another. That's one of the things. And we are reminded how we too should act. And as we begin picking this apart then, we need to remember that we are the church, okay? The people are what make up the church. And there is this tendency, really, all, all through history, 
if you're reading the scriptures, you see that things that we deal with today are nothing new. And you see admonishment given over and over and over addressing these very things. But there tends to be conflict between clergy and laity that comes up over and over again. We just finished reading 1 Corinthians in Sunday morning Bible class. And from the beginning of that letter to the end of that letter, you see Paul addressing conflict between the ministers and the ministered to. And this is something that should not ever be. We are the church. It's not the clergy who are the church. It's not the laity who are the church. It is the clergy and the laity together who are the church. And so on the one hand, Paul says, bear one another's burdens, and then he goes on and he says, for each shall bear his own load. And, and you kind of look at that and at first glance, you go, wait a minute, didn't he just contradict himself? Again, as they tell you over and over, when you read the scriptures, you have to pay attention to context. Okay? So we're to help one another. We're to bear one another's burdens. And, and that comes out in a number of ways. When somebody needs help, maybe even financially, we are to bear one another's burdens. When somebody has fallen into sins, one of the bearing of burdens there is that we care enough to reach out to the person and draw toward repentance, doing this gently, as Paul says. That's one, of the, one other way that we bear one another's burdens. And it, it goes on as we think about it. But each one should bear his own load. How is that different? Each one has his own responsibility that he should do. Okay? And we shouldn't be looking at somebody else's responsibility and trying to interfere with that and trying to do it all, and I can do it better, and all of that sort of thing, but to remember that we each have our role to play. So it's sort of interesting, and I think most pastors experience this, where someone along the way will say, Pastor, you got a lot of work to do. Why don't I take one of your Bible classes, and then that'll free up some time for you. Think this through, okay? We send our pastors to school, uh, and, and ideally their baccalaureate degree, their four years of college, is focused on getting ready to go to seminary. And some pastors have a, a more solid focus in that direction than others do, okay? Uh, but certainly, four years of seminary training at the graduate level just for the sake of being able to teach the scriptures in a way that applies law where it should be applied, gospel where it should be applied, and not confusing those two things, and to be able to sort through the scriptures carefully, seeing how this piece over here fits in its context and how that context fits in the larger context of all of the scriptures and this might relate to that and that to this other thing, that, that sort of thing. So in, uh, in my case, personally, it's nine years of schooling to be able to work with God's word, to preach a sermon that calls sinners to repentance and tells the repentant sinner, your sins really and truly are forgiven in Christ. And to teach a Bible class in a meaningful way, uh, in a way that people can understand, as we pray each Sunday, that God would send faithful ministers who would preach God's word with power and who would help those who hear to rightly understand it and to truly believe it. So to say, you know what, Pastor, I, I've read the Bible once or twice. Let me take your Bible class so that you can do the other things. Maybe it would be better if you did the other things for which you are probably more qualified than your pastor is so that he can do the very things 
that he has been called to do. Your pastor has the burden, the responsibility, the load of preaching and teaching God's word. That's his primary thing, office activity in the church, okay? Make it easier for him to do that. On the other hand, the pastor should never think that he knows it all and is going to give you advice on how to fix your car necessarily. If he has some skill in that, he might offer something. But it's not his place to tell you what kind of car you should buy unless you're asking his advice. Not what home you should own or maybe it's time for you to downsize and you really ought to do that and you should listen to him because he knows better or what job you should take or how to handle your boss. If you ask him, he might be able to guide you in those things. But that's not primarily his area of expertise. You have things that you know far better than your pastor could ever hope to know. It's not his place. Okay? Nor is it really his place to fix the political climate of the country in which you live let alone any other country in the world. Now, that isn't to say that there are not moral things that we address, but your president's sins are not exactly going to be addressed here. The idea of this or that candidate stands for this or that thing, which perhaps is directly contrary to what God's word says. And if you're going to vote for, promote, support that candidate, understand that at some level, you're supporting the things that he stands for or she stands for or whatever. And, uh, and therefore you might actually find yourself fighting against God's word. Yeah, yeah, your pastor might talk about those things short of telling you, you must vote for this or that person. And it is not the pastor's place to call out every sin that every politician does. It is your pastor's place to call out your sin. Because preaching about somebody's sins who is not even here to hear well, that's kind of gossip on the one hand, isn't it? You're not doing an appropriate thing with the information. Okay? It's kind of on the level of gossip. And if they don't hear it, how can they repent and be saved? So I could preach all day long about the sins of the politicians and everything going wrong in America. And you can go merrily on your way on the road to hell thinking you're doing fine because I never call out your sins, the things that are interfering with your salvation. And so it is that pastors have to remember what they are here for and not get distracted about a million different things. But focus on the work they are given to do. Okay? Laity are told, share in all good things with those who teach. We immediately think about our pocketbook. Okay? Yes, that is in fact a part of it. And I personally am very grateful to all of you because you have taken care of me and my family all these many years. We have wanted for nothing, truly. And we are absolutely grateful for that. And you are to be commended for that. Doesn't mean you should stop, right? As I said, one of the things we do is we teach keep on keeping on. But it's not all about money. It's not, okay? Pastors are human beings. Whether it's your current pastor today or a pastor that you had 40 years ago. Your pastor's a human being. Will make mistakes. Your pastor sins on a daily basis, just like you do. No, it's not okay. Not any more okay than it is for you to sin on a daily basis. Okay? If your pastor has sinned against you, one of the good things 
to share with your pastor is forgiveness. That most good thing that you can share with another human being. Forgiveness and patience and encouragement and all that sort of thing. So don't, don't think too narrowly about these things. On the other hand, when your pastor sets about to call you to repentance, repentance, which is one of the more um, fear-invoking tasks for a pastor, because your pastor, like everybody else, does not want to be mean and nasty and harsh and doesn't want to get you upset to the point where you run away and go off to some other congregation, which is so easy to do in our day. And that makes it all the harder to call people to repentance. Your pastor hears the words in a spirit of gentleness. Do it in love. Do it gently, being aware of yourself, lest you be drawn into sin. Whether it's the very sin the person's doing that you're calling to repentance, or more likely, that you start to think much of yourself. Oh, these sinners. Oh, how I have my life in order. Yeah. Except how does Paul start off? Avoid becoming conceited. Whether you are the guy in the pulpit or the one in the pew, all of us need to remember that we are not to be puffed up, but that we are to look at the people around us and recognize they are every bit as valuable in the eyes of Jesus as we ourselves are. Every bit as valuable. And here is where looking at Jesus as example is very, very valuable. When you see someone calling attention to himself or putting someone else down, very often people say, oh, he's got a big ego. Yeah, but not really. The one who will put another person down most likely has a very weak ego. And if someone has to call attention to the self over and over again, they have a very weak ego. Consider Jesus. This is the one who has it all, okay? This is the great prince, the king of kings. This is the one whom the angels themselves, even the creatures closest to the throne, when they speak of his glory, they cover their faces out of respect to him because he's that great. Okay? And what does he do when he comes to earth? And he's dealing with his fellow clergy as he, as he indicates. He himself is an apostle as he sends out his apostles. He came to serve as he calls others to serve when he is gone. Does he rip them up one side and down the other and put them down? You lose it. Oh, you're so pathetic. Blah, 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 blah. Gently over and over again, encouraging, building up, helping them to see through their own foibles, accepting them back after they have denied him, restoring them fully to the ministry that he has called them to do. Feed my lambs, feed my sheep, okay? He's not pointing to himself and saying, I am so smart, I am so good. You guys are all stupid. You guys will never get it. You guys are all worthless. The Holy Spirit is never gonna be able to do anything through you. No, 
quite the contrary. Does he call to repentance? Yes. Does he chasten? Yes. Does he encourage? Absolutely. And does he walk away when he ascends into heaven, leaving it in the hands of his called ministers and the people to whom they minister? Yes, he does. He does. And so whether it's the clergy with clergy or the clergy to the laity or the laity to one another or the laity to the clergy, we are all called upon to think like that. None of us knows it all like Jesus does. He truly is the know-it-all in the real sense of the word. None of us has the ability that he has. None of us is anywhere near as powerful as he is. Which of us could ever rebuke a storm and it would listen to us and calm down? But he can do that. And yet he comes in gentleness, even with his time. Did he go off and take a break? Go off in the mountains to pray alone. Yeah, he, he did. He made sure to take care of himself because he became a human being. And as a human being, he had to rest. And if we don't tend to the basic needs of the self, we cannot tend to the people around us. We will exhaust ourselves and be useless. So yes, he does do that. But time after time, they're tugging at his, his shirt sleeves and the hem of his garment, aren't they? Help me, help me, help me. And he does. He takes the time. He does what they need. And, and he educates and clarifies. And even with the ones who are conceited and think much of themselves, he loves even them, telling them parables so that they can start to see themselves from the eyes of God and think of themselves as ones who are fortunate to be saved and recognizing how fortunate they are to be saved and how good that is that they would not belittle others who are fortunate enough to be saved. There is an illustration which is extremely biblical that helps us view these things in a good way, at least in the sense of how clergy and laity are to deal with one another. When we are baptized, we are adopted into or born again into the family of God. We become brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, the great King of Kings. If we are a brother or sister of the King of Kings, that means that we ourselves are royalty, part of the royal family. We are all princes and princesses. So in the mind of the clergy, pastors do well to recognize that when they are ministering to God's people, sitting in front of them, are princes and princes and carrying that load in that office with that responsibility. They can be mindful that they are dealing uh, as far as the office goes with ones who are more noble than they. They are serving the royal family, the brothers and sisters of the king of kings, the great emperor. Laity, on the other hand, when they are in the pew or any other dealings with clergy, ought to remember that this one is sent as the major d, if you will, as the household servant who has the responsibility to parcel out this or that thing at the right time and in the right way. Okay? The members of the household, no matter how honorable and exalted they may be, do not have the right to make use of everything at any time in any way that they please, but the master has put his servant there to take care of these things so that things are all done in the way that the master 
wants it done. So laity do well to view the ministers as ones who represent Christ himself. If both sides do these things to the best of their ability, then things usually go along fairly smoothly and there should be less conflict. But one of the things we always need to remember is to listen, take the time, be patient enough to hear and never say, I'm going to tell you, but I'm not gonna hear a thing from you. If you think you have a right to speak, then you also have the responsibility to listen. And we are told even in the scriptures to be quick to hear and slow to speak. And it's been pointed out by the uh, business gurus that go around encouraging people in business and how much more to be encouraged in the church that God made us with two ears and one mouth, therefore maybe we should be uh, you know, listening twice as much as we are speaking. Probably a really good rule of thumb. And why all of this? Because God knows it is difficult for us sinful human beings to keep on keeping on and to persevere. And St. Paul even says, don't grow weary in doing good. Sometimes it feels so hopeless. And sometimes we deal with one another and we think we're talking to a brick. And I suppose in some ways we are because God says we are spiritual stones being built up into this temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the church members of it. So I suppose, fair enough, sometimes we're just talking to a brick. But God wants us to know that we should keep on patiently doing good anyway because if we persevere whether it's in the church or outside of the church we will reap the harvest it will have a good effect as the holy spirit desires if we will not give up and the greatest effect blessing harvest fruit that we could have is the salvation of our own soul and the souls of the people around us. If we always remember that the most important thing is that we and the people around us end up in heaven, then a whole lot of other stuff doesn't matter all that much. We need to make it into heaven. And our Savior Jesus has given us all the things that we need to make it into heaven. He won forgiveness for us and he gives us ministers to bring that forgiveness to us indeed even on a daily basis that we may hear and believe that our sins truly are forgiven in our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Please arise. And now the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
almighty and everlasting God, who art worthy to be had in reverence by all the children of men, we give thee most humble and hearty thanks for the innumerable blessings, both temporal and spiritual, which, without any merit or worthiness on our part, thou hast bestowed upon us. We praise thee especially that thou hast preserved unto us in their purity thy saving word and the sacred ordinances of thy house. And we beseech thee, O Lord, to preserve and extend thy kingdom of grace and to grant unto thy holy church throughout the world purity of doctrine and faithful pastors who shall preach thy word with power and help all who hear rightly to understand and truly to believe it. Send forth laborers into thy harvest and open the door of faith unto all the heathen and unto the people of Israel. In mercy remember the enemies of thy church and grant unto them repentance unto life. Be thou the protector and defender of thy people in all time of tribulation and danger. And may we in communion with thy church and in brotherly unity with all our fellow Christians fight the good fight of faith and in the end receive the salvation of our souls. Bestow thy grace upon all the nations of the earth. Especially do we entreat thee to bless our land and all its inhabitants and all who are in authority. Cause thy glory to dwell among us and let mercy and truth, righteousness and peace everywhere prevail. To this end we commend to thy care all our schools and beg thee to make them nurseries of useful knowledge and Christian virtues, that they may bring forth the wholesome fruits of life. Graciously defend us from all calamities by fire and water, war and pestilence, scarcity and famine. Protect and prosper everyone in his appropriate calling and cause all useful arts to flourish among us. Be thou the God and father of the widow and the fatherless children, the helper of the sick and the needy, and the comforter of the forsaken and distressed. Accept, we beseech thee, our bodies and souls, our hearts and minds, our talents and powers together with the offerings we bring before thee, which is our reasonable service. Heavenly Father, the news is full of violence, both within our own country as well as in other nations throughout the world. These things are truly disturbing. We pray that you would look in mercy upon everyone who has suffered violence and that you would comfort them by your holy word and grant that your people use such occasions to do good acts of mercy that Christ's name may be glorified and sinners called to repentance and the brokenhearted built up. We pray that you would bless the perpetrators of violence that they might repent and also be saved. And as we are all indeed strangers and pilgrims on earth, help us by true faith and a godly life to prepare for the world to come, doing the work thou hast given us to do while it is day before the night cometh when no man can work. And when our last hour shall come, support us by thy power and receive us into thine everlasting kingdom through Jesus Christ, thy son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Please be seated.
Please rise. <clears throat> the Lord be with you. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, who with thine only begotten Son and the Holy Spirit art one God, one Lord, and in the confession of the only true God, we worship the Trinity in person and the unity in substance of majesty co-equal. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, Peace of the Lord be with you always. O oh, Christ, the Lamb of God, and take us away the sin of the world, have mercy on us.
send thine only begotten Son into the flesh. We thank thee that for his sake thou hast given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we beseech thee not to forsake thy children, but evermore to rule our hearts and minds by thy Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve thee through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen.